Hello everyone. I will not be asking the fellows and residents any questions today, so everyone can sit back, relax, and hopefully find this unusual neuroradiology talk interesting. Prior to becoming a radiology resident at Yale, I had no interest or experience in doing anatomic dissections on very small structures. I'm giving this talk to show that during my career at Yale as a radiology resident and later as an attending, I found out that performing these types of dissections and imaging the specimen clarified a number of clinical neuroradiology issues and demonstrate the value of understanding the fascinating evolutionary and biologic changes of some brain and arterial structures. When I returned to Yale as a neuroradiology attending, I was very fortunate to have hired Jerry Conlogue, now Professor of Matters at Quinnipiac, to work as my lab assistant, preparing the material that I was planning to use for further research. Some of the specimens you will see were injected with a specially prepared radiopaque barium gelatin material devised by Jerry, which, who injected the material into the arterial system and the cerebral ventricular system. All the dissections and the photography you will see were performed by me personally. When I was a resident, prior to the era of CT and MR, plain films were all we had to look for abnormalities. Was this optic canal in a patient with visual problems abnormal or an anatomic variant? If we decided it was abnormal, the patient possibly would be subjected to additional painful and potentially uh, dangerous studies such as a pneumoencephalography. I decided to do an embryologic and radiologic investigation to study the development of the optic canal. So I examined a number of fetal uh, optic canals, and as you can see here, at the earlier stage, the optic canal has somewhat of a keyhole type shape and progressively gets rounder as the optic strut that separates the optic canal from the superior orbital fissure develops a second segment. Here are some radiographs showing the same thing early on, 28 week, and keyhole shaped canal, and later becomes rounded as the second segment of the optic strut develops. And b depending on the development of the optic strut, you may have a, a keyhole shape in the adult, you may have the normal rounded appearance, or split canal. The split canal, the upper part of the canal is for the optic nerve, the lower one is for the uh, ophthalmic artery. As you can see here in the specimen where with the split canal, the optic nerve is in the superior canal and the ophthalmic artery comes off the carotid into its own inferior canal. While normally, like in this round canal, the, optic, uh, the ophthalmic artery joins underneath the optic nerve in a single canal. I published this uh, in the investigative radiology and uh, there it sat for a number of years. And recently, the last two years, Ahmed and I noticed uh, when we look at not a small number of uh, CTAs, that sometimes you only have and on a, an ophthalmic artery on, on one side going through the optic canal, not on the other side. And some of the anomalies, the ophthalmic artery comes off the middle meningeal and enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. So for instance here, this is like a normal coronal uh, uh, image and we can see the, in dark the two clinoids on either side this is the optic canal with the nerve above the ophthalmic artery, which is enhancing bilaterally. Uh, here is a specimen showing the optic canal and the anterior clinal laterally, the optic strut below the, the optic canal, and here's a beautiful reformatted oblique reformat, the catheter showing the optic canal, the ophthalmic artery, uh, 
and the clinoid and the optic strut over here. And in the anomalies, you will see the optic uh, uh, ophthalmic artery within the canal, but not on this side where the ophthalmic artery is going through the superior oval fissure, just like on the axial plane. This is now getting ready for publication. Now another issue which was much more serious when I was a resident were the so-called J-shaped cella. People thought that this cella looked like a J, letter J, lying on its side. What it really meant, people thought there was excavation here anterior to the cella, usually by a tumor of the optic nerves, like an optic nerve glioma. So these children who had, let's say, had visual symptoms were then subjected because of the reading of this uh, for pneumoencephalography, which was quite a big issue and somewhat dangerous in children. You had to put them under anesthesia, inject the oxygen or air, and it was not a simple study to do. When I looked at these, I thought that, I didn't think that these were particularly abnormal. So I did a study looking at I dissected a number of sphenoid bone to show the development uh, in the region of the cella and also to see what the optic canal looked like in the roof of the optic canal. And here are some radiographs of similar age uh, fetal specimens. And turn out that the so-called excavation was really not, not, nothing at all. It was just the roof of the optic canal there was somewhat prominent coin causing this little uh, area region, which people call an excavation. So these were all normal uh, children's uh, sphenoids. This is a true excavation due to a large glioma, but this, which was also called abnormal, was just a normal uh, appearing cellar and precellar sphenoid. That was even more accentuated when the Many times the patient was somewhat obliqued on the plain film. And again, these were all called abnormal when they're actually normal. Uh, this work uh, won the Memorial Award from the AUR as the best, uh, every year they, used, they give out a, uh, an award for the best paper by a resident and was published as the lead journal in the AJR in 1968. So it was it was quite prominent for a few years, but as soon as CT came, there was no need for this anymore, and it uh, sunk without a trace, so to speak. When I returned to Yale as an attending, I was asked by Newton and Potts, who wrote this classic uh, series of uh, books, to do a study on the embryology of the skull, so I examined various fetal specimens as to the frontal bone, the occipital bone as well as the, as the <coughs> temple bone and also again the sphenoid. Because of this work, and now we're getting to the main part of this talk, I was asked to write a chapter on the development of the embryology of the cerebral arteries. As soon as I got into that, I realized that just talking about embryology w was not adequate. I had to look at the evolution of the cerebral vasculature in the brain. So this became a, a much larger project. And after this, they asked me to do a study of the cerebral ventricles, also just embryology. But by this time, they knew that I'm not going to be limited just to that. So I did a much larger study on the uh, evolution in embryology of the cerebral ventricles. And because this, these textbooks are no longer published and very hard to find, I'm putting down my e email address here. If anybody would like a PDF of these two chapters, I'll be happy to send it to them. Okay. We all know that these are the hippocampi here and the temporal lobe. But they occupy a very small part of a very large brain. I remember when I was talking about the limbic system, I was talking about the supercolossal hippocampus, also known as the inducium grisium, here demonstrated by Netter, overlying 
de corpus callosum. And of course, we can see that as I showed in my limbic talk, here's the indusium grisium, the supercolossal hippocampus. So what is, this, what is the hippocampus doing above the corpus callosum? Interestingly, if you look at this uh, 12 week old human fetal specimen, note there's hippocampal cortex here on the medial wall of the cerebral hemisphere lateral to the uh, frontal horn. When I dissected a 13 week old a human fetal specimen, I noted this incredible crescent shaped hippocampus that extended all the way from the frontal lobe into the temporal lobe. I put little H's on there. So this is, this is the hippocampus very early on development. Quite a structure extending all the way around. Now the interesting thing is, is if you look, here's a, platter, a diagram of a platypus, uh, a primitive uh, a mammal, and look, here's the hippocampus again, surrounding, very similar to what we see here in the human early on. Turns out that hippocampus in early uh, mammals like egg platypus or marsupials is quite large. The black is all a large hippocampus. Even the turtle, look at the size of the hippocampus occupying most of the cerebrum. As the brain evolves, progressively, as the corpus callosum develops, it actually develops within the hippocampus, the hippocampus gradually becomes smaller in the hemisphere and just remains in the temporal lobe uh, while the corpus callosum takes over the rest of the brain because of the neocortical development. And if we look here, for instance, uh, these various mammals, Early on, you see the in black the large hippocampus kind of surrounding uh, along the ven medial ventricular wall, and then in the human, we we have then what we used to the hip temporal lobe hippocampus and the supercolossal hippocampus. You have this little black line. So that's all that's left from a ma massively large hippocampus. And again, we can see that it, this was a dissection that I showed before of the hippocampus in a 14-week human fetal specimen with a large uh, hippocampal fissure here. And we can see the same thing, here it is on an intact uh, MR of a fetal specimen of s similar age. So here's the rudimentary hippocampus with a large uh, hippocampal fissure. But notice we can see it again up here on the medial aspect of the frontal horn, very similar to the way it appears here. And if we look at the sagittal MR, here's the hippocampus again, crest, traveling as a crescent from the frontal lobe to the temporal lobe. And then eventually it will just remain like this. Now, one of the problem of comparing human development with the other animal development is the issue the ontogeny recapitulate phylogeny. Haeckel was a very famous uh, German scientist in the 19th century. Uh, he, he was not the first, but he popularized the term ontogeny recapitulate phylogeny, meaning that there's repetition of ancestral adult stages and embryonic or juvenile stages of descendant. Uh, it's the theory of recapitulation. Because it was a catchy term, it became extremely popular. But it turned out that this was wrong, because uh, there was, it was really it was gradually fell into great discredit because they did, there was really uh, the di the diagrams that he did did not really show what he claimed. So there was this was no longer accepted, and it's never it's not been accepted since his time. The new uh, Gould, in his great book, Ontogeny and Phylogeny, summarized what the, n the new terminology should be. 
Phylogeny is a evolutionary history of a lineage depicted as a sequence of successive adult stages. Ontogeny is a life history of an individual, both embryonic and postnatal. And this is important, the heterochrony is evolutionary changes in the timing and the rate of development of features already present in ancestor, leading to changes in size and shape. That's very important because it's all about the timing and the rate of development which makes appear the changes that we see during evolutionary stages. So it's still, I think, okay to at least think of the phylogenetic changes because as you can see again here, here's the hippocampus and the, and the platypus. And here, for instance, again, in this textbook, the human hippocampus is very similar to that. And then we see development of the corpus callosum. So as long as we don't carry it too far, I think it's okay, because as you'll see later, it helps understand what we see in the human brain. Now, I was always uh, fascinated by the complex anatomy of the middle cerebral artery. You know, it's kind of a three-dimensional architecture. Why was it so complicated? If we look at the lateral view of the brain, we only see the M4, that is the cortical branches. We don't see the entire middle cerebral. Now to see the entire middle cerebral, we have to pull apart the temporal operculum and the front parietal operculum. And then we'll see M1, M2, M3, the opercula, and M4. So basically, what we have to do is, again, pull the opercula, and then what we see at the bottom, we see the cortex of the insula. Again, if we look at the brain from below, to see the entire middle cerebral artery is shown beautifully here by Bassett, the anterior part of the temporal lobe had to be resected. That's the only way you could see all the entire middle cerebral. Now, this has to do with the way the brain evolved, and I'll show that in a minute. So here we have the basal ganglia. This is the insular cortex. Notice it's surrounded by these massive uh, frontal parietal and uh, temporal opercula. And this is Sylvian Fisher here. So the insula is hidden within this cleft and overlaid laterally by these large opercula. And, you know, if we study the complex anatomy of the middle cerebral, you know, we have the Sylvian triangle, we have the M1, M2, M3, and M4. And this beautiful dissection, again, by Bassett, shows the full middle cerebral artery, at least M2, 3, and 4. And you see all these opercular loops. In the old days, we had to study all this triangle, what was normal, what was abnormal. But more, and now it's more for interest's sake. How did this get to be com so complicated? Again, it all has to do with the insula here and being covered over by the large opercula. I like this statement from the 17th century. Of diverse parts of a human body, it is very difficult to learn the true use without consulting the bodies of other animals. I love this term, consulting. It shows a lot of respect and bodies, notice, is capitalized. Again, showing respect to the actual structure itself. Now, we all know from our medical school studies about human embryology, the tri-vesicular brain, you know, the prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhombencephalon. But it turns out that this is not just a human uh, definition. Here it is again. It's used all and just in any kind of development, uh, in, or th we have the trivesicular brain. Now, how did the trivesicular brain start? Early on, very early on in evolution, there were three primary sense organs, smell, vision, and then balance, and later hearing. So the evolution of early appearing three primary sense organs are likely the stimulant for the trivesicular model of the brain. 
So that's why we have olfaction, vision, and hearing and balance. So that's why it all started as a trivesicular brain. Now, if we look, here's the frog I dissected. You're going to have to use to looking at these. So this is a lot of you front here, back here. So this is the forebrain for, you know, an olfactory brain. Then we have the diencephalon here, the roof of the diencephalon. And this is the optic lobe for vision. And the frog, the cerebellum is very tiny. This is some contrast material within the fourth ventricle. So this is more or less an early model where things are basically the same structure, uh, almost like a trivesicular brain. Now here's some principles that we have to know. Higher invertebrate and all vertebrates move head first. Thus, the anterior region of the body is the first to encounter environmental stimuli. Thus, it's advantageous to place the major sensory or organs and that control most anteriorly. From the worms upward, evolution of the cerebral of CNS is characterized by progressive cephalization of the nervous system. So what is cephalization? Cephalization is a constant cephalic shift of the control center throughout evolution with the anterior most part of the brain being the most highly elaborated. Now, specific functional needs in different vertebrate groups result in various region, regions of thickening, infolding, and outpouching of the brain. Now, this is important. Once a new brain structure appears during evolution, it remains in higher forms, even if it re reduced functional need reduces its size. This helps explain the location and size of various brain structures, as you'll see later. So. Here, let's look to some of the stages as diagrammed here. So in the primitive stage, the brain basically is an olfactory brain. Later on, in the amphibium, you start getting uh, in this kind of yellowish. This is the archipelium or the hippocampus. The key for us is the neocortex, which is here in pink. As you progress, you will see more and more of neocortex, and you can see here, and kind of pushing the olfactory brain inferiorly. The rhinos fissure, or the sulcus, separates the neocortex from the old uh, olfactory cortex. So look at, for instance, the change. I showed this before. Here's the frog. Notice in the iguana, you know, as an example for a reptile, that the the, the hippocampal, the cerebrum, is now much larger than it was. It was quite small in the frog. Look how much larger it became. It's now sitting on top of the olfactory brain here. And notice we no longer see the diencephalon. It's been covered by the progressive larger cerebrum. So now we have the cerebrum and the optic lobe, you can see the optic lobe leading to these large or, or optic nerves here. But no, we no longer see the diencephalon. If we now progress from the iguana to the rabbit, notice the rabbit has still a smooth cerebrum, but it's much, much larger. We no longer see the optic lobe. The brain is not progressed. It's covering the olfactory brain. It's still small anteriorly but it now reaches the, the cerebellum and we don't see the optic lobe It's because it's gotten so much larger. In the cat, compared to the rabbit, we have further development of the frontal lobe, the occipital lobe here starting to cover the cerebellum and we see the salsa and gyri and notice that the olfactory brain is pushed further down and not as visible as it is in the rabbit. And when we compare the cat to the dog, notice uh, the increased sulcation and the gyra in the dog compared to the cat. My apologies to cat lovers, but that looks more evolved here. The cerebellum is getting partially covered now. And again, notice it's not so easy to see the olfactory system 
although the factory bulb is still quite large. So again, as we progress here, there's sulcation, gyration, and, uh, and the olfactory system gets covered by this neocortex, like we see in this diagram, as this gets larger and larger. And of course, the big change is in the primate. Uh, notice how the occipital lobe is so much larger now and overlies the, the cerebellum. And also, the olfactory system, relatively speaking, is much smaller when you compare it. Look at the bulb here and the bulb in the monkey as smell uh, uh, reduces its importance relative to the other functions. And of course, the major change in the human brain. Notice the marked enlargement of the occipital lobe. Look, this whole empty area here in the frontal area is the prefrontal human cortex, and we don't even see the olfactory system, uh, while well, we can see it minimally here in the monkey. Now, why did all this happen? It has to do, be to do with the marked development of the association area. Notice, for instance, in the shrew, that all the motor, the somatico-sensory, the visual, and the auditory are all bunched together in the upper part of the cerebrum. But by the time you get to the human, these are all separated uh, quite a bit. And the white is all these association areas for the complex uh, activities that the brain uh, does so that's why we end up with this separation and, uh, and this appearance of the brain with all these various uh, uh, functions separated by large, mainly association area. The disadvantages of cephalization is the loss of, the, of the, all the control centers like for vision, as you'll see later. Here I'm just showing the, the changes in the brain looking from above. And th this is the ventricular system that was injected, you remember, and we radiographed. So you could see the change of the shape of the ventricles and also notice the somewhat linearity of the brain in the shark and in the frog. And later in the iguana, we started the development of the cerebrum, gets larger and larger and larger. And notice how gradually you no longer see the olfactory brain because of marked development of the frontal lobe and the thickening. You see this all neocortex, and also notice the sh change in the shape of the ventricular system, which I don't want to get into now. And just to show, here I put a dissected brain next to the undissected uh, skull, and notice that the skull is so much larger in the dogfish and the frog and even the iguana, but when you get to the monkey, because of tremendous expansion of the neocortex, the whole calvarium now is like brain, while here it's just a small, the brain occupies a small segment. We can see it also on the sagittal, this section I did, that notice how the brain in the monkey occupies a huge area here, takes over a lot of the olfactory you know, the nose and stuff because of the expansion of the various components and the skull gets much thinner. Now, I already talked, so the first advantage of doing all these dissections and looking at animal brain was that I immediately knew that this uh, idea that the corpus callosum develops in an anterior to posterior direction was wrong and that genuine and I already talked about this at length when I talked about the corpus callosum. So this is wrong. And all you have to do is look at the development of the brain and with the development and increased size of the frontal area, uh, and you know that the corpus callosum cannot start in the genu. It's only when you have a marked development of the frontal area, the prefrontal area, that you get a true genu, as I said before. So anterior to posterior development of the corpus callosum was not supported by evolution, not supported by embryonic analysis, as I showed, and not supported by MR analysis.
It grows bidirectionally. That's the story, and has not been refuted. And again, this was published in AJNR. And again, that they, the lastly, the rostrum made no sense from an evolutionary point of view either. And again, the rostrum and the lamina rostralis were, were there right from the beginning and not the last to develop. And we can see here, which I showed before, here's a 14-year-old we call fetus, rudimentary corpus callosum. We can already see the rostrum here. And this anomaly of the corpus callosum of a five-year-old shows again rudimentary corpus callosum, the fornix here, and the rostrum well developed. So the the lamina rostralis segment of the fetal rostrum is already present before the genu and, and sphenum de develop. And it's not the last segment to develop. This again was published and again not refuted. So let's now talk about the vascular development of the brain. So ver some very important principles I want to mention here. The vessels of the brain do not de develop as an independent phenomena. The vascular system constantly adapts to the developing brain. The end arteries are the first to develop and supply a constant functional territory mediated through the sympathetic fibers. The end arteries develop syn synchronously with the structure they supply. The developing vascular system is continually adequate continuously adequate for the structures at its particular stage of evolution and embryology. There's no anticipatory development of arteries and veins for structures that have not yet appeared. That was uh, very important stated by Treater, who was a very important early 20th century embryologist. So if we look here, these are diagrams. So the, these are the end arteries. These are always constant. So the variation in the vascular trunk that we focus on because we see them are of secondary importance. The variation in the arteries and vein, some people call them the servants of the capillary or also conducting pine, depend on hemodynamic factors such as closeness, economy of distribution, and convenience of the source of blood. So all the variations that we see are really just secondary to just the evolution of the cell side, the gyri, and other factors. But these end arteries are constant. That never v varies. But unfortunately, we don't uh, yet do not see them. We only see the conducting pipes. So let's look here. This is a shark, uh, injected shark that I dissected. What do we see? This is the forebrain, and this is the optic lobe here. And these are the olfactory, large olfactory bulbs here. So this is the olfactory artery. And as you can see in the diagram, this is a large lateral olfactory artery that supplies the olfactory forebrain. And here it is on a craniochordal projection. Now when we get to the reptile, in this case the iguana, we start seeing a rudimentary middle cerebral artery, which is a tiny branch coming off the lateral factory. So if we look here at this injected arteries uh, covering the iguana brain, so here's the lateral factory artery. Then we see a tiny little branch. This is the rudimentary middle cerebral artery. If we now look at the rabbit, the middle cerebral artery is not much larger, but notice that we can see the entire middle cerebral artery from its origin from the carotid. These are all middle cerebral branches. Remember, started as a tiny branch coming off the lateral factory artery. When we compare the rabbit with the sheep, Notice that the sheep, we no longer see the entire middle cerebral artery because there's now op operculation. So we have part of the frontal parietal opercula uh, covering uh, 
as some of the middle cerebral artery, we still see lower down because the temporal lobe is not as developed yet. So we see uh, the ciliary fossa, but not above. And notice when we compare the sheep to the monkey, the monkey, like in the human, we only see the cortical branches because the large sylvian fossa here has been closed because of the evolution of the temporal lobe and the frontal parietal, and all we see are the M4 branches. And notice we can see the same changes in very early human fetal development. Here's a very early 17-week-old, very smooth brain, no salsa, no gyrite, a large sylvian fossa with the insula at, at the depth of it. Later on, we're starting to see some of the primary salsa and gyrite, and we're beginning to see the closure posteriorly of the sylvian fissure. But still, we see part of the insula at the depth. And then 32 weeks, more gyrite, more salsa, almost complete closure of the sylvian fissure. See just a little bit of the insula at the depth. And the same thing happens uh, as we saw in the animals, also in the human. Notice in this 14 week, in white are the middle cerebral artery branches. Notice we see the entire middle cerebral artery tree here. However, later on, because of the, the embryologic development of the opercula, we're now not seeing the entire middle cerebral. We're seeing the opercular branches, the cortical, just a little bit of the insula here and the M2 branches. And of course, in the adult, as it will be in the child, we only see the cochlea. So again, just like an evolution, just as progressively the middle cerebral artery was covered and we only see the caudal branches, also in early human development, these things uh, will occur. And when you have anomalies, sometimes you will see in a very rudimentary human brain that you will end up seeing a lot of the middle cerebral, again, because of the lack of operculation. And for instance, here, in this five-year-old, see these very large, this, there's no sylvian fissure here. This is the stage of a large sylvian fossa, and here is just the insula, but the opercula are very poorly developed. So you have a fossa, not a fissure. And again, if we look at evolution at the base of the brain, See, notice how you can see the middle cerebral artery in the rabbit, in the cat, even the monkey, and even in early uh, human development, we see the entire middle cerebral. But later on, because of the marked expansion of the temporal lobe, we no longer see this whole complex here because the temporal lobe has developed to such a degree. So again, in these diagrams, progressive enlargement of the neocortex pushing the olfactory brain down and more medially. And this is a nice diagram here showing, again, coronally the evolution of the neo, in pink, the neocortex. Here it is rudimentary with a large olfactory uh, brain here. This is the rhinal fissure separating. Notice how as the neocortex grows and expands, it pushes the olfactory brain more and more medially into the temporal lobe, with the rhinal sulcus being also displaced more and fairly medially. So here, for instance, the rhinal sulcus and the rabbit, quite laterally, this is the olfactory brain in the medial part of the temporal lobe. Here it's pushed a little more medially in the cat, and the monkey, it's very medial here. And then in the human, you cannot even find the rhinal sulcus very easily. The entire olfactory brain, the piriform lobe is squeezed medially and inferiorly. For instance, here, here's some dissection. Here's a rabbit, has a large hippocampus. Look, notice how thin the neocortex is here below the, this large hippocampus. In the dog, relatively speaking, because of the neocortical development, the hippocampus gets smaller, with a little thicker neocortex. And look here, here's the, in the monkey, the hippocampus, much thicker, and neocortex in the frontal lobe. And of course, 
in the human, the relative diminution, relative speaking, of the hippocampal size compared to all this neocortex of the anterior part of the temporal lobe. And again, if we look on coronal dissections that I did here, here's a hippocampus and a rabbit occupies a large portion of the temporal lobe, smaller, relatively speaking, than the monkey. And look at the human, the hippocampus, only a small part of the temporal lobe, and all this is neocortex. MR of a human, a small hippocampus, but notice relatively much larger in the monkey because there's not as much neocortical development in the temporal lobe. And the same thing can again see early in development. If we look at this 14 we call human fetus, I, I cut a window here to show. So look, relatively large hippocampus and a very small, uh, relatively small neocortex of the temporal lobe. And here's an MR again to show the hippocampus and the, uh, the neocortex. Look at all the CSF here. Many times, even normally, we'll see a lot of CSF in the anterior temporal lobe because the human uh, neocortex of the temporal lobe is, is the one of the later areas to ev develop. Again, notice the striking difference between the fetus here and the human as far as temporal neocortical development. And we can see that again here in the hedgehog, the olfactory brain is huge and occupies invisible a large part of the undersurface of the brain. But if you look at the human, everything has been squeezed way medially here. Here's the olfactory bulb, the track, but all these structures are not seen. You kind of have to, you don't see it if you look at the base of the brain. You basically have to pull the entire temporal lobe all the way laterally to see this olfactory brain, uh, all the connections in the medial part of the piriform lobe. That's all hidden because of the neocortical development. So again, to explain the middle cerebral, it all started as a covering for the, in which ended up being the insula, and the neocortex around it made it disappear uh, that we don't see the entire middle cerebral. If we look here, as the neocortex develops, it pushes the basal ganglia immediately. So for instance, in the reptile, the striatum is very large with a thin cortical layer. But in the human, massive neocortical development pushes the basal ganglia in. We get the information of the insula and of course, the opercular of the frontal, temporal, and parietal lobes. So again, if we look at this three-dimensional architecture of the middle cerebral artery, it can be explained by the evolutionary changes of the brain. It all started at M1 and as a little branch off the olfactory artery, and gradually, as the neocortex evolved and expanded, and because the confines of the skull, it had to be confined, and the opercular developed, covering the older uh, brain uh, of the in the insular region, and that's why we get this interesting tridimensional architecture. Now, Enlo in this book compared the evolution of the brain. This is like a dog's cast, like the original Corvette, and the human brain as this old-fashioned camper, and I guess we still prefer this over this vehicle. Again, I like this old 17th century statement. What is often more condensed or concealed in one species, nature displays more clearly and openly in another. How true, because only by looking at the evolution can we understand some of the features of the human brain. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is the posterior cerebral artery uh, as well as the aqueduct. Now, if we look at the posterior angiogram of 
of the posterior circulation, we all always focus on the pica, on the ica, and on the posterior cerebral and its, all its branches. Some of us may pay some attention to these little branches here. So what are these little branches? We have the thalamoperforates, we have the medial uh, choroidal and the posterior choroidal, later, I'm sorry, the medial and lateral choroidal, and then we have the posterior pericoloso branches. Now what I'm going to show you, that these tiny branches are actually where it all started, that all this uh, came later as a neocortical development. And then I also want to talk, how do we end up with this aqueduct and this uh, quadrigemal plate? This is a remnant of an earlier large uh, structure, the optic lobes. So let's go back to this diagram I showed. Smell, vision, the optic lobe. This is the center for vision. It happened to be, in the shark, the largest of the three primary components because all the, all the various sensation, uh, you know, like smell and uh, position was all kind of, uh, the final center was in the optic lobe. And uh, so that's why the optic lobe was larger. And here I'm showing the injection of the ventricles so this is, the, this is the optic ventricle within the optic lobe. This is the rudimentary lateral ventricle, the hypothalamus here, and the large cerebellar ventricle. So this, this is the area of interest, the optic lobe. And here we, to show again, so this is the barium gelatin filling the ventricular system. So here's the optic ventricle and this is the optic lobe. It's much smaller in the, in the frog, but again, prominent optic lobe with a small optic ventricle here. Just again to show what it looks like, optic lobe. And in the iguana, again, a large optic lobe, visual center here, and here's the optic ventricle. That's just again, just to show the optic lobe and the optic ventricle. Now, in the rabbit, we start, we're getting the cerebral ventricles. We're starting to see, so here's the optic ventricle. And here we're beginning, so he, getting the transformation to the future quadrigemal plate aqua. Here in the rabbit, here's the optic lobe. Notice that the, the upper part, which will be the eventual, become the superior colliculus, that's the center for vision, is larger than the inferior part. But this is still an optic ventricle with two recesses, one for, one for vision and one for hearing. Still does not look like the aqueduct. But later on in the cat, notice as the occipital lobe, what happens sometime during evolution that there's a supersegmental visual coordination or center. So the occipital lobe become the primary visual center. As the occipital lobe gets larger and larger, the midbrain visual center, that is the optic lobe, gets smaller and smaller. So here, for instance, a larger occipital lobe, a smaller optic lobe, and the optic ventricle gets smaller. And notice again, in the dog, as the occipital lobe has gotten larger, the, the optic lobe has gotten much smaller and starting to assume the shape of what the quadrigemal plate would be like. And notice that this is now beginning to look like the aqueduct. And of course, in the monkey, we no longer have an optic lobe. We have a small, a quadrigemal plate, still fairly prominent. But look at the size 
of the uh, optic of the occipital lobe overhangs the cerebellum. So this is where all the complicated visual activity uh, ends up. You know, it's a huge area now, and this has become rudimentary. So when we look at the human quadrigeminal plate, that's it's a remnant of a very large optic lobe in, uh, in other animals. And the aqueduct in the human is, is just the remnant of a large optic ventricle. So when we look at the ventricular system, we see the aqueduct, as I said, quadrigeminal plate. Those are remnants during evolution because the, the occipital lobe took over the core, the visual uh, functions that the optic lobe used to do. Now, why this is clinically important, you'll see in a minute. Notice this is the tectum. The tectum in a 12 week old fetus is quite large. Look, it's much larger than the cerebellum, and it progressively gets smaller and smaller and the occipital lobe gets larger and larger. Look, early on, the occipital lobe is very rudimentary. It gets larger, larger, and eventually overhangs, and progress at the same time, they get smaller and smaller. So just as the, just in evolution, the vision uh, is taken over by the occipital lobe, also in the human, we see the diminution of the tectum, which would have been in the earlier, uh, primates, the optic lobe, getting smaller and smaller. Now, why is this important? Because many times, clinician would come and say, you know, patient may have some visual problems or whatever. They say, why? This seems like the, the quadrigeminal plate is prominent here. and uh, Could there be a tumor there? So you have to be aware that this would look large, especially in preemies compared to what we expect it to look as in a child. And this was a paper that was presented. We actually was started, it was started by Christopher Filippi when he was a fellow, and then Sanjay Saluja took it over also when he was a fellow. But at that time, we did not have easy ways of measuring uh, the size of the quadrigemal plate. Then Vivek finally uh, did a great job doing very careful measurements. And so th these are fetal MRs measuring at various ages the size of the quadrigeminal plate. And it was progressively smaller. So uh, all these measurements were made. So the mesocephalo demonstrates relative diminution during fetal development. The relative size of the tectal plate should not be mistaken for pathology. So again, it may look prominent, uh, but it's just part of the normal development. And the last thing I want to show is the changes in the posterior cerebral artery. So here again, this is the posterior cerebral artery, which at that time and the iguana just supplies the optic lobe here. We can see all, all the branches overlying the optic lobe, and also in the shark, large optic lobe being supplied by branches of the posterior cerebral artery. But notice now, in the rabbit, we already have a small occipital lobe overlying Again, still prominent branches going to the optic lobe. However, in the cat, because of the further expansion of the occipital lobe, we now have posterior cerebral branch, besides the branches that supply the optic lobe and the thalamus, which by the way, progressively gets larger as a relay center as the cerebrum or the neocortex gets larger. But now we have finally the larger cortical branches of the posterior cerebral supplying the enlarging 
whole occipital lobe. And relatively, these branches get smaller. So when we look, when we look at the brain, when we see this looking from above and behind, here are the peduncles, here's the entire posterior cerebral artery, that these are all came later as the neocortex developed. And these tiny branches, relatively speaking, uh, you know, the lateral and medial, choro uh, medial choroidal, the lateral choroidal, and posterior pericolosal, these were the original branches that were there in early on evolution. And these large branches that we see, which we focus on, ap appeared much later as the occipital lobe and the cerebellum and the whole neocortical development. So this, uh, this was the uh, later development, and these were the early branches. And I think this is the last slide I want to show. I hope you found that interesting, at least I found it interesting studying it, because it gives a whole different perspective to what we see in the human brain. Thank you for your attention.